Hello and welcome to the podcast. You're here with Physique Development. Today, we're going to continue right along with our new myth busting series. The first episode of this series was all about why strength training isn't only for men. And if you guys didn't hear that episode, I think you'll really enjoy it. It was a great discussion. And uh, yeah, it was a great discussion. And I, it was the first episode of the, the myth busting series. And this is episode two. So in today's episode, we're going to jump right into a discussion about why quote unquote bad genetics is a poor excuse for you to latch onto when trying to make improvements to your physique. Now, something I want to preface this conversation with that I think is really important to preface this conversation with is the fact that, you know, we're aware of the realities that some folks have better genetics than others when it comes to building muscle, gaining strength or losing body fat, et cetera. Right. And some are more susceptible to things like obesity than others are genetically and Again, we, we all know those people that sort of can just look at a weight and get big and strong or quote unquote, like have it easy, right? When it comes to the goals that we may want to achieve. And we're not here to discount those realities, you know, for us, for you, for anyone. That said, we are here to have a discussion around the fact that regardless of these realities, why latching on to the statement of quote unquote, I have bad genetics, what's the point of trying? And how that's essentially putting uh, a lot of your potential that you do, in fact, have to waste. And we're going to talk about that today and how your psychology directly can and will impact your physiology, right? Your psychology can directly impact and it will impact your physiology. And we're going to get into that today. But before we got into that, got into that, before we get into that, um, I would like to open up the floor uh, to, to uh Alex or Sue, I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with Alex actually, because before we started re to record, um, we were talking about this, this legendary photo that kind of always gets brought up and, and Alex likes to put side by sides with it. It's, <laughs> it's I, a great one. I can't, do. it's a great one, dude. And I, I can't let it die. Um, so Alex, the first question I want to pose, uh, is do you think you have quote unquote good genetics and has that answer changed over the duration of your life or lifting career at all? Yeah, that answer has has very much so changed over the time frame. I think that when I got started, um, at, well, yeah, I would say when I got started, it was something where I did not feel as though that I had great genetics to put on muscle tissue. I, I think that any of any, any, any individuals who have seen the photo that Austin is speaking to would, would agree that as a freshman in high school, um, I guess 14 years old, mm -hmm. something like that, um, to be under 110 pounds is probably something where it's like, eh, probably need to need to put on a little bit more muscle mass at that time, buddy. Uh, and I was also to give reference, I was not short. I was not like a super small person. I wasn't super tall either, but I definitely need to be weighing more than I did. Um, now, I guess from a genetic standpoint of losing body fat in that time frame. I was very blessed in that realm of, I was a leaner individual, so I didn't carry a whole lot of body fat. So I was, I, I had muscle definition for the very small amount of muscle tissue that I did carry because of the lack of, of body fat. Now, as an adult, I would say that I have a, honestly an easier time putting on muscle tissue, but my ability to lose body fat is uh, different than it was at that time. So um, from a genetic standpoint, I would say that those things change. Uh, as time has gone on. I think that it's it's looking at it and I love the way that you phrased it of using the term like I have bad genetics what's the point or like bad genetics is a poor excuse because bad genetics isn't the problem the problem is what we allow that to be within our circumstance and what we believe we can achieve and accomplish and that comes from your mindset and you get to choose your mindset now that doesn't mean that you can just choose to have good genetics and like Austin said we're not discounting the fact that some people do have an easier time building muscle or losing fat or insert thing here. But it really does come down to your psychology and your physiology and how you can show up in those moments. Because I actually had a coach early on in bodybuilding who told me that I just wasn't going to cut it. I didn't have the look. I didn't have the genetics. And it wasn't really worth my time to continue doing it. And I could have let that just kind of break me down and just believed that. But I decided, hey, 
that's not how I view things. I'm going to make this happen. And being able to really put my head down, change my mindset and work towards that, I was seeing potential that I had that I wasn't letting go to waste. So I think it is extremely powerful to just put in the work as well as to change your mindset towards things. And looking at, yes, people have different circumstances and life isn't fair. Somebody who works really hard and checks all of the boxes versus someone who might just be able to get there easier than someone else. That's not fair, but nothing in life is fair. You could look at any circumstance that you have in life and say, well, that person has it better, so why should I even try? And that's a really sucky way to look at life. And that's a really sucky way to go about life because you have now just completely put the ceiling on where you're at and what you can accomplish. And then you're stuck under that ceiling, not accomplishing what you could be accomplishing if you changed your mindset towards that. So I would definitely say for myself that I have never really thought like, oh, I have the best genetics. I mean, even take my glutes, for example, if you would have saw my glutes pre-Alex, we'll call it PA, uh, (laughs) or what is it? It's a BC. So before Alex, BA. And then after Alex, um, they are incredibly different. And that came from me actually realizing like, hey, I can do this. And then also pairing that with intelligent programming, pairing it with a coach that believed in me and doing the work to get that um, muscle recruitment and to build what I needed to for my glutes instead of just saying, oh, I don't have good glutes. No one in my family has good glutes, X, Y, and Z. I was able to really build something out of nothing because I didn't put that limit on myself. Yeah. And I think everyone right now, you know, sort of in this virtual room is or has done things that we otherwise never thought we could do. And we absolutely grew up, I'm sure, with people that maybe were teachers or coaches or anything that also second that, that, hey, maybe you're not cut out for this, man. Like, maybe you should try something else. Maybe you're just not gonna be a a very smart kid. Like, maybe college isn't for you, you know? Maybe bodybuilding isn't for you. And it's like, all right, that's fine. But also, ignorance is bliss, and we talk about that a lot. And there was this sort of, in sort of insane self-belief and delusion that we all sort of have in the beginning that I think is sort of looked over, right? And, and I know those ter- both of those terms typically are seen as negative, right? Sort of inflated self-belief or delusion or anything like that or ignorance. But in, I think in this case, th- those are honestly positives because if you pair those with, with you know, some rationale, some logic, some intelligence, some good decision making and really hard work. It's like, dude, you can make a lot of things happen for yourself that you otherwise never thought or those around you never thought you could have. And and again, like I, I know we all have done that and continue to do that for ourselves in our lives. And we're just like, we look back and we're like, man, I never, never expected to be doing this here or to have accomplished anything that I've we've any of us have accomplished you know and it's like i mean i can't speak for you guys but like i can tell you right now that that's that's my reality um so i mean off the top of your guys's head here like is that statement true and what are what's at least one thing that you're that's going on in your life that you're like hey i didn't expect this to go on or happen I mean, even my glutes and other, I mean, I'll use the same example of I just literally did not think that it was possible and thought that it was just my genetics and I proved myself wrong. And now I'm standing here and I'm like, look at that. You got fat (laughs) ass. Uh, We're getting there. We're getting back to body fat that I will have a fat ass. But um, I would even say within work and what we're doing right now, and I express this to Alex a lot of the time of I didn't have that belief in myself. I feel like other people possibly had the belief in me 
but I didn't have the belief in myself. And then I wasn't accomplishing those things until I did have that belief in myself and was able to get after and be like, okay, I can accomplish this. I can shift. I can learn. And I think it's important to say that if you're not passionate about something, then you don't have to pursue that. But if you have something that you want to happen or you want to pursue of being able to put your head down and work and not use excuses, because I can tell you, however you define success, excuses don't really hold a place within that. Right. And I I think that with us starting physique development, it was something where I wouldn't say there was a ton of people that believed in Austin and I, besides Austin and I, and probably Austin's mom, to be honest. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was basically Kelly three was a of us. Fan. Yeah. <laughs> um, so at that time, it was, it, but it was, it was enough for me to just have Austin believe at that time as well. Like I believed in myself in the sense of like I had such a strong passion for what we were doing and, and how we were going about it. And it was a, a really cool experience of just documenting what we were doing and and being able to help people along the way was like an icing on the cake for us. And um, I I think that you have to have that level of of belief in yourself far before uh, anyone else believes in you or it's never going to happen. And so that has been the catalyst throughout all of this where now we're in a a, a space where we've been able to uh, curate a, a team around us. And I can assure you that we have no idea what we're doing, but doing what we feel is best throughout the entire time and, and letting our, our moral compass kind of guide us and, and, uh, taking a route in which we are wanting to facilitate a life for, for others around us, as well as ourselves that is going to be positive and and nurturing and helping others. Um, and I, I think that you have to have that belief in what you're doing before it ever actually happens. Hey guys, if you're listening to this and learning a lot, I absolutely love to hear it, but maybe you feel like you can't apply it perfectly. No worries. We got an app for that. Go ahead and check the show notes or the description box, and there will be a link to go and check out the Physique Development Training Club. This is an app that is going to give you exactly what you need to progress within training with three, four, and five day splits, as well as home and gym options, complete with a timer in there, videos to the training and everything else you need to be successful. So I can't wait to hear how much you love it. Yeah, those are great points. And if you guys are listening and you're like, what does this have to do with genetics? <laughs> we're going to we're gonna break that down a little bit more later in this episode, but I promise you this, this all has everything to do with genetics and uh, epigenetic factors and, and things that, uh, ways that our genes express themselves, turn themselves on or off, right? It's our environment. Uh, and our behaviors themselves in- impact those things. And I'm going to, I'm going to go into that here in just a second, but I'm going to, I'm going to pose another question to sort of like keep us on topic, but sort of shift the, the conversation a little bit and bring this to, you know, more of a segment where we're talking about our clients. So, you know, have either of you had, I'll, I'll start with Sue and, and kind of just ask, have you ever, ever had a client that maybe came to you and said, Hey, I have bad genetics and you were like, okay, that's fine. We'll see. And they ended up gaining, you know, strength, muscle and building, even surprising themselves in the gym. You know, do you, how many clients have you had? Have you had any clients like that at all? Yeah, I definitely have had clients like that. I would have to look back to see the exact number, but it's a big number. A lot of people come to me with self-limiting beliefs of this is just kind of like my body type. This is how I look. This is how I've always looked or I can't look this way. And my favorite part of a check-in is when I get a response from a client or in their check-in, they said, I never thought this was possible. I never thought X. Like I never thought I would have a midsection like this. I never thought I would feel this comfortable in my body. I never thought I would understand food this way. I never thought that I would be able to lift this. Like that quote happens in my check-ins and in all of our check-ins across PD so often. We even have a channel in Slack, which is what we use to communicate, labeled like PD wins. And we all send like client wins in there as well as our own personal wins. And like every day I'll go in there and there's another person being like, I can't thank you enough for changing this or showing me I can do this or being able to get me to this point. So I have 1 million percent had clients that have had that uh, expression um, and come to me with bad genetics or just feeling like they can't improve and been able to get them that improvement. 
I would say for myself, the biggest one is that individuals come to me after months or or years of trying to build their glutes, and they're like, "I have terrible genetics within my glutes or my my glutes themselves," and uh, we're able to turn that around pretty quickly. I, I think that this can go from individuals who are competitors, and this is even more common for the individuals who I work with that are are moms and that they're in their 30s, their 40s, even into their 50s, and they're like, "I have worked so hard over the last decade." Or last two decades to grow my glutes and I cannot make it happen. I know that I'm not your 25 year old client who is, is, uh, a young and able to make this happen. Um, but I want to see if it works and we're able to put on a good density of glute tissue uh, for those individuals who are moms who are in their forties or in their fifties. And we're able to see those transformations because oftentimes it more so comes down to not the fact that they have poor genetics, but lack of, of exercise execution, lack of intensity within their training, lack of understanding how to structure training protocols. Those are the main factors as well as fueling those training sessions or, or being in a situation where they are under consuming nutrients and not giving themselves the fuel to really grow muscle tissue, just chronically being like, I want to be smaller, I want to be leaner. And so putting them into a caloric surplus, putting them into a situation where they're able to train harder with better exercise execution, all of these things end up happening and they're like, oh my gosh, I don't have bad genetics. I just had the wrong pieces in place for me or the wrong protocols written for me. And so once we get those things into place, that alleviates some of these bad genetic thoughts that, that many of our clients experience. Yeah, that all of those circumstances, plus having a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset of believing I have bad genetics and exactly what Austin said to start this, your psychology goes into your or your physiology goes into your psychology and vice versa. And so if you have this thought process of I have bad genetics, and that is a truth you tell yourself, then it's like, I think it's a the Henry Ford is the one that said, I think the popular quote, like whoever believes they can will and whoever doesn't won't because that goes into so much of what we do in life. And I, I will add that uh, as I was speaking to my own bad or, or has my genetics changed over time, it's that when I first started lifting, it was all about the numbers. So how, how much could I deadlift? How much could I squat? How much could I bench press? It wasn't about truly contracting tissue. It was just being able to brag to my friends of I'm stronger than you type situation. And so now as, as a, a trainee, there's much more that goes into my training and I'm not focused on the numbers. Do I still want to see maximal strength or to really push myself with the load? of course, but I have a much greater understanding of how to contract tissue as well as how to execute the movements that I'm performing. So it only makes sense that I'm able to put on muscle tissue better at this time relative to what I once was because of those factors that have changed and progressed for me within my own training. While still always trying to beat Austin, and there's an unspoken competition <laughs> between both of them when it comes to uh, strength. Forever. <laughs> and, and I'm training with Austin in like four or five we or six weeks because I'm going up to Colorado and I'm I am actively getting ready to be prepared for that. I, I can't show up to Colorado and not be in shape and Austin be excessively stronger than me. Is he probably going to lift more than me? Probably. But I need to be in the ballpark. I need to be competitive is what I always keep in mind. <laughs> I have ramped up my training because you are coming. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I tell you, unspoken. I know. But still Unst spoken. <laughs> I'm tracking a little bit closer, all that. I've absolutely ramped my training up. Like, I'm getting up at 6 a.m. now to go train. Like, we're talking. I know I have, I know I have six weeks to get my shit together. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to see how much strength I can gain back in six weeks. <laughs> but as long as... All, I, all I'm going to say is as long as I can match your strength and if I can even beat it, <laughs> hey, dude, I'm going to take that as a huge W in my in my book. So, hey, Austin, yeah. he's um, been asking me, what are the macros on that more yeah. often? So, okay. I, uh, he, <laughs> all right, all right. I, uh, I, I toy with the idea of wondering how great Austin and I's physique would look if we still lived near one another and were <laughs> able to train together as we once did. It would be a totally different look to my body. I promise you that. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. I Yeah, I think I would have... St still look like I lift. I, you know, I, <laughs> that would be a huge plus oh, in my gosh. in my yeah. opinion. Um, yeah, I mean, and and I think this is a really great time to to sort of go through um, some some science behind genetics, right? So it is worth noting, right, that that your genetics, you know, quote unquote genetics, can improve over time, right? Not the actual genes themselves, but the what's called epigenetic factors, right? The environmental factors and those behaviors that influence which genes get turned on and off, 
over the duration of, of your life. And these tend to change for the better in response to exercise, right? So that's why we, there's a lot of reasons we, why we like exercise and weightlifting and you know all of these things. But genetically and epigenetically, things tend to improve, right? In response to this exercise, right? Uh, certain genes that express positive things within our physiology start to turn on. Other ones that express negatively start to turn themselves off, right? And th these, <laughs> this is a reality of genetics. This is reality of our DNA. And it's very, very fascinating, very interesting that our, our belief and our psychology and our actual actions that we put into the world and, and you know, through ourselves into the world actually do have a huge impact on what's going on internally, not only externally, but internally as well uh, in the system, right? So um, everything from your, your hormonal profile, your gene expression, your, you know, inflammatory markers, all these things can change positively in response to, to training, right? Which all of these things changing can positively impact more positive adaptation within your training, which I think is a really, really important thing. And, and if you guys want to take a look at that paper, it'll be in the show notes. It's a 2013 study uh, called Epigenetic Regulation on Gene Expression Induced by Physical Exercise. So if you guys want to get a little nerdy, you guys can go read that. It's, it's going to be linked up in the show notes. But uh, I think... It, what that little little summary allows us to to know and, and can sort of think is our our actions do speak louder than words right but our words do have an impact as well and i, I think that's really really important to to understand right so our psychology affects our physiology and vice versa as sue said um, which kind of leads us into my next question for these guys, which has to do a little bit about body types, right? So a lot, when we talk about genetics, um, you know, especially more colloquially, people are kind of more in your everyday circle. You know, if you have like an everyday conversation about genetics, a lot of people go towards body type, like, oh, I genetically have this body type, right? So let, I wanted to pose a question to you guys uh, here early on. I'm going to start with uh, Alex here, do you, or have you ever written a training program based on someone's body type or follow-up question here, or do you program more based on their past training information, you right? Their successes, their preferences, their goals, things like that. So body type or like goals and preferences. I'm definitely going to program more off of um, goal and previous training success much more than I would be uh, taking into consideration someone's body type. Now, the limb lengths of their body, the structure of their body, I'm going to take into consideration when choosing exercises, but I'm not going to take into consideration the somatotype of this individual's physique when I am creating their training protocols. Um, I've had very, very good success within the program design that I have written of taking into consideration the, the past training success that they've had as, as well as preference and goals and those different factors um, that I don't feel as though that going a different direction is really going to be overly successful or more successful than, than how we're approaching it now. And so I think that the factors that um, we're taking into consideration are much more valuable than the specific body type that a generalization of, of factors are going to put you into. And more so what is happening at this very moment? What is the what is the data that we can collect to have a better understanding of how your body's responding to the training is going to be so much more beneficial. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's good to have a label on something so it provides clarity. But I think that these labels put you in a box to a certain degree. They limit you based on, hey, this is how my body works. And for example, if we're going to take ectomorphs for um, one of it saying have a harder time building fat or building muscle, but lose fat more easily. Now you've put yourself in a box of you're telling yourself, I have a harder time losing fat and I or I've <laughs> I'm just confusing everyone now. I have a harder time building muscle, but I can lose fat. And now you've accepted that truth and you've put that into a box and you've limited yourself and what you can happen because you've put that label on it. So I think that labels can provide clarity, but they can also, again, put that ceiling on you and you have a hard time getting out of it because now you have this like iron belief about yourself that I can't do this or I can do this. 
Yeah. And I think the biggest, uh, another big thing to take away from this, and especially when it comes to body type and somatotyping and I mean, it's, it's exhausting how much information is on the internet about somatotypes and how you should eat if you're an endomorph, an ectomorph, or a mesomorph, or the fact that there's no fourth, uh, actual fourth, uh, classification, right? So there's only three and there's definitely within these three, if you've structured these out, there's definitely a fourth that should be there, right? Sort of like a, more of a, more of a skinny fat ish, uh, look. Um, which I won't go, you know, too, too deep into as far as the classification goes, but like there should be another one, you know, and I also think it's very important to, to know for you, you guys listening, if you haven't heard of kind of where these somatotypes came from, they came from the field of psychology in the 1940s, right? The, these were classified or classifications. Uh, this is sort of a theory of a, a psychologist in the 1940s looking to classify individuals based off their, their personalities and personality traits uh, based on their body type, which clearly makes absolutely no sense <laughs> and very quickly got debunked and did not, <laughs> there was no, not many follow-up questions. It was kind of like, hey man, that doesn't make much sense. We're not going to go with that. Um, and obviously this, you can't replicate that, <laughs> in, you know, uh, time and time again within, within research. So you know, this is sort of like a half-baked idea by a psychologist in the 1940s who was very rambunctious and thought that he could classify people based off of their body type and, and classify their personality based off their body type. And I, I was listening to a podcast um, with uh, Mike Isertel and Greg Knuckles, actually, and they were talking about how um, this lined up, this time period lined up with uh, a, a time period where weightlifting and strength training in these worlds started to collide. And it, th that started to make a lot of sense to me because you sort of have these, you know, forties and fifties and sixties bodybuilders who may have sort of latched on to these somatotype things. And they're like, oh, well, you know, maybe they saw, an, I think it was in a book, actually. I think that's what it was. It was in a book that was really popular at the time. And, you know, people, it was a widely read book. And bodybuilders sort of took that or the weightlifting community sort of took that and said like, Hey, look, these are classifications that work for us too. And that's something that just kind of stuck around. Um, whether that's the, tr you know, hundred percent true story or not, I, I think it's a great way to sort of look at this, um, through a lens of how something was in another field that ended up making no sense, um, kind of got adopted into a, a different field. And now we've sort of held on to this idea and this concept. And now, you know, if you go on the internet or if you're reading you know, you, if you go on the internet, there's tons of marketing around the somatotype idea, right? Whether you're on YouTube, whether you're on a blog or a website and people have, you know, allowed paid ads on their website, you're scrolling and you see like this paid ad that pops up on when you're reading. And it's like, do you know your somatotype? And it's, are, are you a mesomorph, endomorph or ectomorph? And it's like, dude, can we relax with this? Like, this doesn't even make sense. Like, why would we even do this? Um, but to Sue's point, right? I, I think that's, it is helpful that we have some way of classifying something, right? There's, we need some, it, it does help to have clarity, right? And I, I, I don't actually find that to be helpful when it comes to maybe, you know, potentially somatotyping yourself within a, a classification to maybe gain some clarity of like, okay, this is kind of where I fit, but what, what I really wanna get across and, and something that I actually wrote in my book was somatotypes, you know, can be used for clarity or classification, but they should absolutely not be seen as a life sentence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are not a life sentence. And something that is very observable is people will spend, can and, and often will spend time in each one of these somatotype classifications throughout their lifetime, you know, at least one or two for sure. I mean, obviously one, but maybe two or even th all three of them they may depending on their health status um their nutritional status uh everything right their their physical activity level you name it they're gonna potentially spend time in each one of these classifications so if you are a person that's sort of latched onto a somatotype and you're sort of feeling this this self-limiting nature to that classification then dude ditch it because it's not even legitimate to begin with 
right? It's again, a half-baked psychology idea in the 40s that we've really, really hung on to. And I, I think because it adds clarity where there's a lack of clarity for a lot of people. And um, yeah, so if you do feel as if you are limited by this, then ditch it, get rid of it, right? If you feel like it add, does add some clarity, then keep it, but understand that this isn't a life sentence and you can change it with your actions, right? And hiring a coach from physique development can definitely help. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so my next uh, my next question, do you guys want to comment on that anymore uh, there before we move on? I mm -mm. think we got it covered. Yeah, I think I rambled enough on that one. <laughs> um, I think I covered it. So uh, have we're going to move on to to non responders. Um, so this is another thing within the the genetic realm that is very popular. If you read or watch videos on YouTube or read any blogs or you know anything like that, is this idea of being a non responder, right? And and I wanted to ask you guys: Have either of you had a client that is a quote unquote non responder to a certain type of training, or maybe even yourself? Have you noticed that you may be what's labeled often as a non-responder um, to your training or their training. Yeah, I think that I've had clients that haven't responded the same way, but I really don't like the label of non-responder because it not only, again, limits what that person thinks can be achieved, but it's also looking at, we're looking at individuals and that's always going to be the thing that we drive home at physique development is each person is an individual. And so if you don't respond as well, or maybe you don't meet the threshold of it being um, enough of a change change to be noted as a responder and you get denoted as a non-responder, I like to look at that as, hey, now I get to figure out what you do respond to, what is going to work for you, how I can structure things so that you do become a responder. So I think that that term as a whole can be very limiting. As I have stated, a lot of these terms can be limiting. Um, and it's the way that you look at a situation that can really change it. Because I'm sure that there's coaches that would just say, you're a non-responder, like that's it. And they would tell the client that and then not help that client instead of trying to figure out what is it that you're going to respond best to. Because as we continue to talk about genetics, people are going to be efficient in different ways and different pathways within their body. So some clients might be very neurologically efficient and some might be very metabolically efficient and some might not be efficient in either of those. But that doesn't mean that they can't become efficient and we can't get them to a good spot. Correct. And I, I think that also this comes down to a, a couple of, of psychological factors where uh, how does the individual enjoy the type of training that's in place? Um, are they are they in their head before they even go into the session of like, I have this X type of session. I, I don't want to go do this. This isn't what I'm looking forward to. And so it's easy to label them as a non-responder to that type of training when they're giving like 50% effort and not even wanting to be there on those training sessions. Of course, you're not going to respond well when the factors of of just the kind of the the, the pregame or, or leading into the the training session are not in place, so you're not going to have the the best sessions there. And so I think that the biggest thing with program design is it's all going to be uh, data collection. And as and this is something that we we teach all of our clients is that the more time that we have to program for you specifically the more specific that program is going to be for you. So as we have a three month period or as we have a six month period, we can look at the data, look at physique photos, look at the training volume, look at the type of training that we're performing and we can see, okay, was this response good? Do we feel like this was, was adequate? Do we need to make adjustments? What was the biofeedback from a soreness and recovery standpoint um, and, and all the biofeedback markers that we're collecting to have a better understanding of, of how we can continue to make the training more and more specific to you to get the most efficient and, and best results within your training. So as an, a non-responder, there are going to be factors in, in terms of what Sue's speaking to, whether it be more responsive to strength training or, or more responsive to endurance training specifically, um, but there's still going to need to be a balance of all the different factors. Uh, it's not going to be like you're only going to perform strength training for forever and you're just going to continue to respond as you did maybe uh, this year or, or what have you. You're going to have to continue to use the different variables variables uh, because they all benefit from one another. And it's just a matter of how much are we pouring into the cup uh, to make the perfect po portion potion for you. Yeah. And the term non-responder came again from 
like a lot of these terms, came from the research community. And there's a 2019 paper that will also be in the show notes if you guys are interested. Um, but these researchers more or less were sort of lobbying for a change of vocabulary. Uh, instead of non-responder, they preferred the term or the phrase did not respond. And also they uh, followed that up in this the same paper in the discussion section or the conclusion of the term non-responder should be replaced with, with low sensitivity uh, instead of non-responder, right? Because in these cases, uh, a lot of times within within research, the training parameters are very sort of cut and dry, and they're a lot of times um, very simple, simplified and very simple to follow, and, and very, very cut and dry, and every single person has this same exact program, right? And so if you take a collection of 100 individuals, okay, let's say 25 to 30 of them have the same or a similar response, well, that leaves 70 of them, you know, I'm just making these numbers up, but that leaves like 70 of them that have a widely variable response. Some may be high, very high responders. Some may be extremely low. Some may actually get worse, which does happen in some studies. So that was, that training was so bad for them <laughs> that they actually got worse by doing the training, even though they weren't training at all beforehand, right? Which is, is kind of unexplainable in its own right, but does speak to the point of these, it's not that an individual is a non-responder to, to strength training in general. It's that they have, low sensitivity or did not respond the same way that other people did with that training program or training protocol or approach, right? So that's a, that's such a big part of individualizing the training approach and what we do at physique development with clients. The long, Again, like the longer you have with, we have with a client, the better and better and better their training can get, right? Because we have the, those data points as Alex was talking about. So, um, that's a that's a thing where the again self-limiting belief of okay i'm a non-responder right like oh i just don't respond well to, to training right and i think if you dabble in training so that you know if there's a lot of people you know if there's people listening to this this episode and they're like well i, I tried strength training out before it didn't work for me did you give it a fair shake probably not you know because let's say you went in, you did a month of strength training, which is, you know, more power to you. You did a month. Great. What type of training did you do over that month time? Right. Did you try out two to three different styles of training over the duration of three, four, five, six months? Because I think if you did, you would find something that you not only enjoy that you gravitate towards, but you also respond to better or have a higher sensitivity to or if we use the term higher trainability to that type of training, right? Which is a very, very important concept to understand. And so if you, whether you have clients that are, you may be low, low responders or quote unquote non-responders to training, it's not their, it's not them. It may not even be you as much as it may just be the program or the, um, the X's and O's of that program that you've sort of put into place. Yeah, and I think that's a, a good note to make that if you are if you have hired a coach or if you're just doing it on your own and you're figuring something out, giving time is a, a big part of it because you need time to think figure out how those variables are all going to go together. We've talked about variables time and time again on this podcast. We've talked about it within the Training 101 series and just the biofeedback of it all. And you have to give yourself or a coach time to understand what that is, especially if you've had a lot of issues in the past. You can't expect to sign up with a new coach and then just fix it like that. They could. They could hit it on the mark. But also being able to realize there are a lot of different factors factors and they're gathering this data so that they can make the right decision for me so that I can see the best results possible. And there's a lot of different ways to go about resistance training as well. And so uh, you may have a coach who goes about it in a style of maybe some like top set type training or, or more volume centric training. And that could be the only way that they program. And so you find that in a three month uh, period, you have great success with that. But after time, what happens is like, man, I'm not getting the same results out of this. And I think that um, if, you're, if your coach is willing to have a conversation and, and structure training in a different fashion to have a little bit of greater undulization to the design of the program, 
time that's going to be the most beneficial to you, but it could be a time for you to say, okay, I've, I've given my time to this type of training. I feel as though that I'm not responding as great. And this coach only wants to ride it in this fashion. It may be time for me to venture somewhere else and, and see a different type of program design to see if I am more responsive from that type, whatever that type may be. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt, but if you're listening to this and you think, hey, I have bad genetics and I'm having a hard time seeing results, we'd love to be the last coach that you ever need and to be able to help you get the results that we're talking about in this podcast. Go ahead and check the show notes or the description if you're watching on YouTube and we'd love to schedule a free call with you. And there is absolutely uh, merit to people. Some people have better genetics early on versus others who their genetic expression or gene expression improves over time, right? So we all know those people that, you know, I, I more or less grew up as one of them, right? So someone who like was a bigger individual my, my whole life, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so Alex going into freshman year was 110 pounds. Yeah. Sopping wet. <laughs> I was 185 pounds as oh a freshman, <laughs> right? Exactly. And not not a fat 185 no. pounds. <laughs> no, definitely so, not a fat 185. A jacked one. So that I mean, that's purely genetics up to that point, right? We had done a little lifting, but not a lot, right? But if you look at Alex and I side by side now, Alex has put in the work. <laughs> Alex's genetics have come more in his favor over the duration of his lifting career, right? And if you look at a side by side lift with us in a session, it's like, dude, I never would have guessed if I saw you both right now, I never would have guessed that he started out at 185 and you started out at 110, right? right. And that's, that's incredible. That's awesome. Right. And that's a big point of this entire episode is don't have the self-limiting belief of even where you, where you started your journey. Some people start out their journey way ahead of you. But there's a lot of things that come into play environmentally, behaviorally, uh, and genetically that can change that circumstance over the duration of your life, and, and especially when it comes to the physical, right? And that that is also not to say, again, we're not being completely delusional here, right? So if you, if you are a stick figure in your 20s, you probably aren't going to be Mr. Olympia. And that's, there is some sort of reality to that, right? Like, Let's not get too mistaken there. But what I also will say is I can't say with 100% certainty that you couldn't become Mr. Olympia. So, dude, if you have the dream, sky's the limit. Send it. Like, have at it. Because I think one of the most exciting things uh, and something that I, I had in the, the end of these show notes is um, you never, you never know. And it's not until you actually give yourself an, uh, a full strength effort that you realize what you're actually capable of, right? So if, if you, and we've all experienced that, right? We, we've all had self-doubt, right? And I can speak for myself here, high amounts of self-doubt in my life, right? Going through school, you name it. But I was like, you know, what would happen if I gave this you know, kind of screw what my teachers have said most of my life. Screw what these guys, these these coaches or whatever have said to me my whole life. What happens if I just actually tried my absolute hardest at this? What would happen? And damn if I haven't been pleasantly surprised. You know, and I think we all we all are like that. Where and even those listening, give something your full attention, your full effort, your full belief, and even have some ignorance around what is even possible for yourself, right? Because going into this, you almost have to have a sense of ignorance and this sort of inflated sense of self-confidence in, your, in yourself and your abilities to get the job done. Because you know what? Who's it going to hurt? It's only going to help, right? And we've seen it within the research. Again, you guys can look through some of these studies in the show notes. That's that belief in yourself, that belief, that psychology directly impacts the physiology, right? And they've seen this within 
uh, placebo effects, nocebo effects. They've seen this across the board with the psychology of these, these happenings and these events, right? People getting the world-class powerlifters gaining 20 to 100 pounds on their totals by being told they're taking a, a quick, fast-acting steroid that ended up being a placebo. And those who were told it was a placebo, this is from a, a real study, those who were told it was a placebo, they lost all of that strength that they had gained on their totals that path, that previous lift. All of those gains went by the wayside when they were told, hey, you actually were given a placebo. Because that belief in themselves, they're like, oh shit, I, got, I have a steroid on my side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those who were told, even given a placebo, but were told that they were given the real thing, continue to get stronger. And it's like, what is that? You know, like that's, that's your mind, man. Yeah. I was, I was going to bring up placebos if someone else wasn't of just what that power goes. So if you're listening to this and you're like, I don't really think like the way that I think has that much power, my actions matter, but there's a reason that they use placebo to see, okay, how much power does this hold of if someone actually is getting better or insert like whatever the result is supposed to be here or not. And I can say like my physique, my life, my everything has only improved by improving my mindset and believing in myself. Your success is directly related to or your self-belief is directly related to your success. So believe and go after it. And I think Alex is the example I always think of just because I spend the most time with him um, and he very much so emulates what it means to just believe in yourself and to put effort forth for something. He's always been the person that's not only believed in me, but just had like this like incredible belief in him being able to accomplish what he's supposed to accomplish. And you had asked earlier of, okay, what have what has happened that you didn't think would happen? And I couldn't even think of one for Alex because I just feel like anything could happen. He could accomplish anything in the world because he's going to put his head down and he's going to be a fucking workhorse and he's going to be the most competitive and want to embarrass everyone around him <laughs> in the in the pursuit of this maddening belief that he has of what the vision is and i have a hard time always seeing that vision of dreaming bigger and i've talked about before like alex showed me how to dream big and how to want more for myself and that has to do with like we're talking about the environment that you are in and those factors that go into your genetics as well as your mindset as a whole. So definitely not negating the fact that genetics do vary from person to person, but I'll be damned if I would not say that you should just go for it anyways. I will add that I've uh, had the opportunity to build a, a business with the two people that I believe in the most around me. And so that's a, a very pivotal piece to have the pieces around you from an environmental standpoint. The other aspect that we talked about was the, the work ethic towards the goal and, and putting your head down and, and focusing on the things um, that you want in your life and that you're passionate about. And if you're putting a timeline on that, just go ahead and double it. Go ahead and say, I'm going to work for a year and I'm going to get the response that I want. Probably not the case. Probably in two years. It could be three years. But at the four years, <laughs> five years, <laughs> six years, it could be, uh, you know, as, as long as it needs to take, but putting the daily actions in and, and, putting yourself forward and, and, and crossing things off the list are going to be the way that you're going to attain that goal. And the only way that you fail the goal is by giving up on yourself. It's a very common phrase that you hear, but the reality is, is that you're never failing until you truly give up and you're only learning more about yourself and getting closer to the goal, whether it be a sidestep or, or, or forward within the, the aspects that you're completing. So. Yeah. And Alex is also big into biographies. So he reads a lot of like really incredible people's biographies, including um, one that you quoted here of David Goggins, but it, he, like, we've had a lot of great conversation, especially over this past year that we've expressed has been a very hard year, a very challenging year. And each of those tests that come in, we think, we could have given up here, but we just kept going because that's how we're going to reach the success and however we define success and what that looks like. So I think it's really powerful to see that from a lot of people that either we look up to or we've seen accomplish something great and see in their stories, they're like, just keep showing up, keep going, keep doing the hard things and you'll reach what you need to reach. 
Yeah. And I, again, David Goggins, there's so many other uh, great examples of this, but I, I, the first one that came to mind was Goggins because it's, it's one of those things where you got a man almost you know, fast approaching his fifties who is still running ultra marathons, who's still someone who used to be obese, who used to be all of these things, right? If you know his story has this, this lack of, of limiting belief on himself. And, you know, although the, the, it's just something I wrote down here, like, I'm just going to read what I wrote down. It's going to be way better articulated. <laughs> How, so I said, the thing about physical limits is that you absolutely should have no idea what they are, right? Differences in genetic potential are very much reality for us all, as we've talked about over this episode, but you don't know what hand you were dealt until you play it and you play it with the expectation that it's a good one. And that's actually a direct quote from Greg Knuckles um, in an article that I'm going to quote again um, in in the next uh, little bit here. But I thought that part was so great. And, and David Goggins was such an example of that, of although differences in genetic potential are very much reality for us all, you don't know what hands you were dealt until you play it. And this is the most important part. And you play it with the expectation that it's a good one. And I think that's a powerful way to end that quote. And I think, again, David, I wrote, I wrote down David's name because I think Goggins embodies that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He not only plays a hand that was dealt, but he plays it with this insane self-belief that he, dude, it's just a weak mind. I got this. You got this. Let's go. You know? And it's like, he keeps the promises he makes to himself, which we've time and time again talked about on this, on this podcast, right? So it's surrounding yourself with the right people, with the right with a with an approach that can get you there and it's improving that ways of improving that self-confidence has a lot to do as we've talked about on previous ep episodes with keeping promises that you've made to yourself right which then perpetuates the cycle of self-belief and accomplishment and proving time and time again that with those cards that you were dealt you are accomplishing the things that you've set out to accomplish which is a powerful powerful thing so i wanted to quote uh, Greg Knuckles wrote a, a great article in 2014 called Unleash Your Inner Superhero. And then, uh, in preparation for this episode, I, you know, I always read a lot of different things, whether it's research papers or articles written by, by other people in the industry who I look up to. And Greg is, is someone that kind of fits that bill here. And he wrote this great article called Unleash Your Inner Superhero, and it'll be linked in the show notes. But I wanted to read a passage or a paragraph from this article because I, I thought it really hit home for me during when I was reading it. So I thought it may hit home for you guys as we end this episode today. So here we go. All right. Quote, your inner superhero is you without mental shackles. It is what your body is capable of with the help and facilitative ideas and beliefs rather than the burden of debilitative ones. Because of how psychological factors can impact your physiology, the simple act of believing that your training plan or diet will affect be effective will increase the odds that it will be effective. Unleashing your inner superhero starts with believing that you have an inner superhero to unleash at all, right? So you have to have that self-belief. And I love the opening of that. Your inner superhero is you without the mental shackles. It's you without the, the sort of negative self-talk that we all have in our mind, right? We all have these these ambitious ideas. And we're like, no, I could do that. No, I could do that. And then a lot of times that's followed up with, nah, but you couldn't do that because of X, Y, and Z. But it's like, dude, what if you just didn't say the second part of that sentence? Like, what if you just went with the idea that you could do it? Just like follow through with that. And as Alex said, like expand your timeline, commit to that and go, right? And and the I'll finish that quote off and then I'll open up the floor to these guys to, to add any closing statements. But the rest of that passage uh, finishes off by saying what you think, what you expect, and what you believe about yourself can make a huge impact on your progress. Belief motivates action. You never know how good of a hand you were dealt until you play it with the expectation that it's a good one. And damn it if I don't think that's a great way to end <laughs> off this episode. But I do want to I do want to uh, open the floor up to you guys and, and just ha add any closing statements that we have. I, I don't have any. I think that was a perfect way to end things and uh, consider that myth busted. No one's going to help me out here at all. I'm just going <laughs> to carry it on. I didn't know you wanted it in unison. <laughs> go again. I'll, go, I'll get it this time. 
consider this month. <laughs> muth. Busted. This muth. This mutton. Uh, consider this myth. Busted. Busted. Oh, Bussin. Got it. <laughs> whatever it's it. busted and everything else is in the show notes and description box and believe in yourself you don't have bad genetics 